I'm Christopher Streloff. I'm a linguist at Warwick. I'm a sociolinguist, which means generally I'm interested in how people do things with language and how language does things to people. I work a lot in the subfield of language variation and change. I'm especially interested in changes in the sound systems of regional varieties of English, as well as changes in grammar over time and as a result of different social factors like age, socioeconomic status, or gender. Of course, during the lockdown, I'm engaged in important personal research to examine exactly how crazed I can look at the end when they finally let us out of our houses. The work I'm sharing with you today is from the module Dialects. In this module, we study language in the speech community surrounding Warwick, Coventry, and the West Midlands more broadly. On a week-by-week -week basis, students go out into the speech community and do real-world research projects to understand exactly what's happening in language in Coventry and the surrounding areas, uh, and what's happening with attitudes toward language in Coventry right now. In the specific project we're looking at, we partner with one of our local cultural institutions, the Coventry Archives, to use old sound recordings from oral histories made with coal miners who were working in Coventry and born in the early 20th century to look at the origins of Coventry accents today and how they emerged from language in the early 20th century. Because we're sociolinguistically interested in accents in Coventry, a starting point for a lot of our work is to identify the ideas and attitudes about accents in Coventry so that we can understand how these ideologies interact and intersect with what we find empirically about the accent in Coventry. Of course, we always like to turn to academic literature to understand an area. But as this introductory note by Ursula Clark in a chapter on West Midlands English makes clear, Coventry is a blank spot on our map of linguistic knowledge. So we have to turn to other sources. One of the ways that we approach this in the dialects module is to look at popular sources. So uh, seeing what people say about Coventry in the media, we look at Sky Blues fan forums and uh, responses to stories in Coventry Telegraph, or to interview people about what they think about Coventry and what they think about language in Coventry. In our work, we tend to reveal what I'll posit as four central ideologies about accents in Coventry. The first of these is that Coventry has a unique accent that's distinct from other varieties in the United Kingdom, and even more specifically, distinct from other varieties in areas just around Coventry in the West Midlands. The ideology of a locally unique accent show up in things like this Metro piece on 13 reasons why Coventry is cool, with reason 13 being the accent. You also most definitely hear these ideologies when you talk to Coventrians about Coventry accents. I'll play clips from the BBC Voices project, which is housed at the British Library. This was an oral history project by the BBC done at the turn of the 21st century to document different varieties of, of Englishes across the United Kingdom and to document attitudes toward local accents and local dialects. You'll hear two clips from the interviews with Coventrians talking about the uniqueness of the Coventry accent. The first, you'll hear that Coventry is distinctive from Birmingham. In the second, you'll hear that Coventry is not only distinct from Birmingham, but distinct from the nearby village of Bedworth, which is just a few miles to the north. Birmingham isn't that far away, and yet the Birmingham accent is really far removed from Coventry. A Bedworth man comes from Bedworth. And in Coventry, we refer to them as Bedworth. We use the W. But somewhere down the Longford Road, there's a line. Once you go over that line, you drop the W. And if you don't drop the W, they know you're from Coventry. So these clips reveal that the ideology of a locally unique accent in Coventry is so deeply held that the uniqueness of Coventry and its accent extends not only to Birmingham, which of course is a very socially salient accent in UK dialects, but also to a very nearby community so that you drive down one road going from Coventry to Bedworth, and all of a sudden you have this major change in the local accents. So this ideology of a locally unique accent in Coventry, an accent that is exceedingly rare, uh, is deeply held and important to the sociolinguistic space of Coventry. A second, ideology that we routinely identify uh, that is remarkable in its paradoxical nature to the first ideology and yet just as deeply held is that while Coventry has a locally distinct, totally unique accent, it also has no accent at all. 
Again, turning to the BBC Voices project, we hear another speaker in the same recording with the first two speakers, a, a speaker who also attested to this idea that Coventry has a unique accent from Birmingham and nearby Bedworth, saying that he perceives no accent in his own speech. To me, I don't think I've personally got an accent. And if, if I had to describe, I would say a Midlands <coughs> accent. Um, from a personal point of view, I don't think I've got any accent at all. All three interviewees in the BBC project in some way share this idea that they don't personally have accents and that other people in Coventry don't have accents. And this shows up fairly routinely when you talk with Coventrians about accents in the area. And of course, what's striking is that this ideology that Coventry doesn't have an accent directly and obviously contradicts the first ideology that Coventry has a locally unique accent. Of course, sociolinguistically, this isn't that surprising. We know that when we take facts about language and ideologies about language, people generally force the facts to align to their ideologies rather than adjusting their ideologies on the basis of fact. But we see it here in Coventry in the conflict between these two ideologies, with both exist within the psychology and the social space of language in Coventry. A third ideology that we see is that Coventry's accent, which is locally unique and also doesn't exist, uh, whatever it is, it's terrible. It's fairly routinely the case that there will be surveys of how much people like different accents within the UK, and Coventry will always do pretty badly on this survey, and of course Coventrians are aware of this, uh, and this is also part of the sociolinguistic landscape. Uh, so for instance, in this survey, which is uh, reported in Coventry Telegraph and also is totally non-scientific and not valid in any way beyond establishing what the popular psychology is of Coventry accents, uh, here Coventry shows up as the 40th worst accent out of 50 described in the United Kingdom. But crucially, as the headline states, uh, at least it's better than Brum. A fourth ideology we can add to our list is that whatever the accent in Coventry is that is locally unique, we don't have, it's terrible, but at least it's not Brum, it's getting worse. The kids are ruining it. Now, to be fair, this is by no means unique to Coventry. There's a general ideology across Englishes and probably across all language varieties that kids are ruining the language, but it definitely shows up in Coventry, as you'll hear from this clip, once again taken from the BBC recordings. The kids only have a 25-letter alphabet, and the letter that is missing is the T. For instance, this is Coventry City. You never hear them say city and they can't be bothered to put the T into the middle of a word. The interview is describing what we often talk about in linguistics literature as T glottaling, where a sound that would traditionally be expected to be produced as a T is replaced by a glottal stop. Of course, this is a widespread sound change across varieties of English in the United Kingdom. What's striking in this interview is that the speaker attributes this sound change to something like a moral failure. Kids can't be bothered. They're too lazy to say the word the way that he would expect them to. And of course, this is where we get the sociolinguistic space of this sound change. It's not a change in the language that's unmarked uh, and unevaluated, but actually a change that reflects something happening in the social fabric of Coventry that is being manifest in the way that people pronounce particular variants of the language. So we emerge with four ideologies about accents in Coventry that are deeply held in the sociolinguistic fabric of the community. That Coventry has a locally unique and distinctive accent, that Coventry has no accent at all, that Coventry's accent is terrible, and that Coventry's accent is getting worse. We can use these ideologies as our sociolinguistic foundation for what the space of the accent is. And then we can take our objective studies that we do with data, like what we work with from the Coventry archives, to establish exactly what the characteristics of the accent really are, and then we can compare that objective foundation of what the language variety actually is to those ideologies and see where the intersections and interactions between them occur. Of course, across the module, we bring the whole 
range of linguistic tools to bear to understand what the local varieties of English are. When we're talking about accents, though, we're particularly interested in the sound system. So we're interested in phonetics, which is the objective description of the sounds people produce and the sounds people perceive in the language. And we're interested in phonology, which is the description of the underlying sound system of the language, the inventory of vowel, consonant, and other sounds that exist within the language, and the mental representation of language, what the sounds that are stored in speakers' minds are. We worked with recordings from interviews collected for an oral history project about the coal mining industry around Coventry in the 20th century. We worked on the basis of the apparent time hypothesis, which suggests that speakers are something like linguistic time capsules of the phonetic and phonological system of the language that was in the speech community around them at the time they acquired their language. Because most of the speakers uh, in this oral history collection were born in the early 20th century. Working with these recordings gives us insight into what language was like in Coventry more than 100 years ago, and that's data that we can't access now because most of these speakers have passed. We study these recordings by examining the acoustic components of the speech stream. These are spectrograms. A spectrogram is one of the tools that you'll learn to use to do phonetic analysis. These in particular show two pronunciations of one of the uh, purported shibboleths of Coventry accents, which is to say the word B-U-S as buzz rather than bus. Bus. Buzz. For our purposes, what the spectrogram shows us is the sounds that are actually objectively emerging out of the human vocal tract. And we can use the objective acoustic data to understand how people are actually forming speech sounds. For instance, the dark regular vertical bands show us vibrations of the vocal cord, which is adding voicing to the airstream. And the dark horizontal bands show us the way that the oral tract is being adjusted to shape vowel quality, which is what we associate with the different vowel sounds that we hear in our language varieties. In the case of vowels, we can then use the frequencies that are associated with each vowel in a person's speech to describe how they are forming the sounds in their language. We can then extrapolate from that to describe what the sounds are within a particular person's language. We can describe what the sounds are in a language variety, and we can do comparisons between varieties. So we can compare, for instance, uh, vowels that are produced by speakers in Coventry to vowels that are produced in other studies of the West Midlands. So with these tools, our students can go from these old recordings of Coventrians to objective descriptions of the origins of accents in Coventry. Then we can compare our objective description of the Coventry accent to the ideologies about accents in Coventry and see how the two inform each other. As a disclaimer of our four ideologies, we can actually dismiss at least two of these out of hand just on the basis of linguistic knowledge. So ideology two, that Coventry does not have an accent, is of course absurd because all speakers have accents. The difference between what we recognize as an accent and what we don't recognize as an accent reflects social evaluations of what varieties are standard and what varieties are non-standard or marked. So really we could get rid of that one, but we'll address it anyway. We'll also cheat on the third ideology that Coventry's accent is terrible because, of course, linguistic knowledge tells us that all language varieties are equally valid in terms of communicative efficiency, grammatical complexity, and all these issues. So we won't deal with ideology three. But we will deal in a good substance with ideology one, that Coventry has an accent that is ex exceedingly rare by looking at what the old sound recordings tell us the accent in Coventry is and then comparing that to other varieties in the West Midlands, and that the accent is getting worse. Uh, in this case, by looking at the process of tea glottling that was mentioned by the speaker as a modern day way that kids today are ruining the language and see what evidence there is for tea glottling in the earlier recordings of Coventry English. For our description of the Coventry accent and examination of whether the Coventry accent is really exceedingly rare in comparison to other West Midlands varieties, we turn to a very well-known feature of regional Englishes in the UK, uh, which is whether or not vowel systems have one or two vowels that might be represented by words like foot and strut. Of course, it's very well known that 
southern varieties have two vowels here that are distinct between these two lexical sets, and that northern varieties have only one vowel, and that this distinction between two vowel systems for foot and strut and one vowel systems where they sound the same is one of the major distinguishers of regional accents between the north and south in the UK. The Survey of English Dialects, which was conducted in the 1950s and 60s, can give us a baseline for this variable. And that study found that the areas around Coventry had the northern one vowel system where foot and strut were pronounced and perceived as the same, rather than the southern vowel system where there were two distinct vowels. We would expect then in these old recordings that speakers would only have one vowel and would pronounce foot and strut the same, rather than the southern system of two distinct vowels. What we actually find when we look at the acoustic evidence, though, is much more complex. In this chart, we've plotted the acoustic vowel space of the foot and strut vowels for one of the speakers in the coal mining archive, James, who was born in Coventry in the early 1920s. The red triangles show the acoustic measurements of the words that we would expect in a southern system to be produced with a foot vowel, and the gold crosses show the acoustic productions of words that we would expect in a southern system to be produced with a strut vowel. In a northern one vowel system, which is what we're supposed to see in Coventry on the basis of Survey of English Dialects data, we would expect to see all of these measurements plotting on top of each other. In other words, we'd expect to see one big mass of strut and foot vowels all occurring on top of each other because they're all being pronounced exactly the same way. By contrast, in a southern system, we'd expect to see these plotting in distinct spaces. So we'd expect to see one area where foot words are being produced in another area where strut vowels are being produced. In James, we don't see either. What we actually see is the foot vowels being produced in a fairly concentrated area in exactly the space where we would expect all speakers to have foot vowels. But we see a much more complex picture for strut, where strut sometimes occurs in that space on top of foot, but also sometimes occurs down in a more central and lower space that we'd associate with strut in southern varieties. In fact, for that strut vowel, James shows a tremendous amount of variation between pronunciations that are very foot-like, like what we would expect for a northern speaker and what the Survey of English Dialects tells us we should expect in Coventry, uh, to very southern productions where strut is a lower, more central vowel. You can hear this in this recording of James, which includes several cases of words that would canonically contain either a foot or a strut vowel. Those words are bold in the transcript, so you can hear his variation of productions of strut vowels as having either a very footy quality or sounding more like a southern strut variant. You'd got a den church once a month. Else you couldn't play. We kept together, our team did, and uh, we went in the Birmingham, the Sunday School League. They got one, two, and three then. We went into number three and we won that. We went up into number two, we won that. We went into number one and we won that. For me, the clearest manifestation of James's variation in pronunciations of the strut vowel from having a foot-like quality that we'd expect in the north to a strut-like quality that we'd expect in the south uh, really shows up in his different pronunciations of the word one, which just within this sample varies between sounding like a foot word and sounding like a strut word. That's strikingly different from what we would have expected from the Survey of English Dialects, which would have been a straightforward matter of every pronunciation sounding just like foot. The same pattern shows up in the speech of William, who was also born in the early 1920s, and Gordon, who was born in the 1950s. In all three cases, we see foot occurring as a fairly tightly constrained high back vowel, but a complex profile where strut acoustically occurs across a wide range of space. Sometimes it overlaps with foot in productions, exactly as we'd expect for a prototypical northern accent, but sometimes it occurs in a lower or more central space, as we'd expect for a southern dialect. Strikingly, in any of these cases, the profile that we provide for Coventry on the basis of these old recordings is much more complex for the strut vowel than we would have expected on the basis of Survey of English Dialects data, which means we've used this data to actually change what we thought we knew about the accent in Coventry.
It also gives us a baseline for comparing the data that we observe in Coventry to other varieties, and specifically for our interest to other varieties in the West Midlands. Unfortunately, Coventrians get a little more uncomfortable with what we see in this picture. This view doesn't look good for the ideology that Coventry has a unique dialect. When we compare the data that we observe in Coventry against the description provided by uh, Ursula Clark and Esther Asprey of West Midlands varieties, we see that they've actually described what is happening in the Black Country and in Birmingham in exactly the same terms as what we observe in Coventry in these old recordings. Foot occurs over a fairly tightly constrained space that we associate with the U vowel, while strut occurs across a range of spaces from U to A uh to A. Uh which is exactly what we observe in these recordings. This reveals pretty big problems for that ideology that Coventry has an accent that is exceedingly rare, locally distinctive and unique. In fact, what we actually observe in our data from this class project is the Coventry accent in terms of its vowel system is very much like other West Midlands varieties observed in Birmingham and the Black Country. That means in our list about ideologies of Coventry accents, we can now scratch off idea one that Coventry's accent is exceedingly rare. And of course, while we're all at it, we can also re-scratch out idea two that Coventry doesn't have an accent. It means we're down to just one more that Coventry's accent is getting worse. Since one of the interviewees mentioned Teague Lottling, we can look at that feature in these old recordings to test the ideology that accents in Coventry are getting worse. I'll play clips from William, again born in the 1920s, and Gordon, born in the 1950s, where a T occurs in the segment that would be subject to T glottling in a position between vowels within a word. For the Griffin miners, of course, it was Griffin Coven. It was an upholster for a little while. So both speakers engage in this process of T glottling. What this shows us in both cases, but especially in the case of Gordon, where glottling is a fairly prominent feature, is that T glottling has a much deeper history in Coventry than just being a recent innovation uh, introduced by kids who can't be bothered to pay attention to the language. In fact, glottling has been around in Coventry English for at least a century and has a very deep tradition in the language. This means the tea glottling in Coventry isn't a recent innovation at all, but rather a long-standing feature of the accent. That means that we can't use tea glottling and its associations with teenage speech as evidence that the accent in Coventry is getting worse. In fact, if teenagers are participating in Coventry and tea glottling today, then that's very much reflective of the long-standing history and heritage of the Coventry accent. Of course, this is only a small illustration of the knowledge that we can gain about accents and ideologies toward accents and varieties of language more generally, based on our linguistic studies of old language data. What's striking here, though, is that we're able to do that in the context of a classroom. In one week in a classroom project, we were able to engage with deeply held ideologies that exist in our speech community today and see how those ideologies can be challenged and problematized on the basis of knowledge about the language that we can create by going to a new linguistic resource and studying as a learning community together what these language resources tell us about accents, dialects, and language varieties that surround us. In addition to the knowledge that we create that's interesting to us as linguists and sociolinguists, a project like this also enables us to do good work for our partners in the community. In the case of these old recordings, they were previously stored at the archives in old plastic tape cassettes that eventually would have degraded and become unusable. And that means these interviews would have been lost. Through the process of digitization, we create a permanent resource, which of course we return to the archive. And that means that this aspect of Coventry's cultural and historical heritage is permanently shared and can also be shared with users of the Coventry archives and the Herbert Museum and Gallery. We've also presented on two occasions findings from this class project at the Coventry archives to share knowledge about ideologies toward accents in Coventry and aspects of the history of accents in Coventry with people in the area. And what's kind of ridiculous about all that is that this is one week of one module. So we're able very quickly in consistent ways with the ethos of the way that we learn and the way our curriculum is structured at Warwick to very rapidly do a real meaningful research project achieve findings that challenge what we thought we knew about the variety that we're studying, use those findings to interrogate 
beliefs that are deeply held in the community that we're working from and use our knowledge to affect a cultural institution that we've partnered with to do our research. So in a very short order, we're able to take a classroom research project, find real knowledge with it, and do real good in our communities because we're applying good linguistic theory and good linguistic practice to real speech communities. That's exciting, and that's the kind of learning that we get to do in this module and across the curriculum in Applied Linguistics at Warwick. 